Hello, everyone, and um, thank you for the opportunity to share some information about palliative care and hospice. My name is Lori Bishop. We have a lot of ground to cover in a very short period of time. Um, this is what we're going to look at today, the comparison of palliative care and hospice, so you can understand both of those benefits and maybe the burdens a little bit of, uh, uh, of using those things, uh, understanding the criteria that a hospice must look at to um, determine eligibility for someone to use the hospice benefit. And then a little bit about the opportunity of what you all can do to help educate um, providers of hospice care on um, the PSP disease and other similar um, conditions and how they progress. So I think there's a lot of ground to cover. We'll do some uh, slides and then we'll get to Q&A. First of all, palliative care has um, expanded over the last several years. But it's important to understand that palliative care is not a reimbursed benefit currently through Medicare or Medicaid. Um, the bulk of what palliative care services are covered are really the billable visits of a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. It is um, broader and available at any stage of an illness um, in comparison to hospice. It is focused on advanced care planning and goals of care discussions. So helping people make informed decisions about treatment options and care um, and making sure they understand the benefits and burdens of those uh, decisions. Um, it also focuses on symptom and medication management, care coordination, education and support of not only the individual but their caregiver. Um, we strive to have an interdisciplinary team in palliative care, just like we do in hospice. But again, under traditional uh, Medicare, the only reimbursed service is the um, physician, nurse practitioner, or uh, physician assistant. And then there are some measures for those uh, people that are um, billable practitioners under um, the Medicare called the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. So it does look at the quality of their care um, and you can look at some of that, um, it is publicly reported. Um, on the other side of that is hospice. And hospice is a Medicare and Medicaid benefit. You have to be eligible for Part uh, A Medicare to have the benefit as a Medicare um, beneficiary. You must enroll in the benefit, and um, it is for the patient and the family, the, the whole unit of care. It is comprehensive and interdisciplinary. So you have not only the physician or nurse practitioner, but you have nurses, social workers, chaplains, trained volunteers, and um, other professionals. And it is focused on just the terminal phase of an illness. So while palliative care was for further upstream, but may be limited um, to find it just because of the lack of reimbursement, hospice is well reimbursed, but it is only for people in the terminal phase. We've already talked a little bit about Medicare Part A. Medicaid and most commercial insurances also have a hospice benefit. When we talk about that terminal phase of an illness, we're talking about a life expectancy of six months or less if the disease runs its normal course. And so that has to be certified by a hospice physician and your primary care physician. Um, it is focused on comfort, not curing a, a disease. Most often these are diseases that aren't curable, but um, uh, you also have to choose to enroll in hospice care. So there has to be informed consent. Um, a little more about the services provided. We talked about that it's comprehensive and interdisciplinary team. And um, really that is to focus on the whole person and not just a disease, right? We know that there's a lot of stresses when someone has a serious illness for several years and there's support that needs to be given to the caregiver. Um, there are equipment needs you may have in the home to keep you in the home. There are uh, medication adjustments um, and symptoms that must be well managed. 
Um, there may be stressors related to financial concerns and things like that. So in hospice care, we try to look at the whole person and the whole family and say, what do you need? How can we wrap services and care around you to help you with having the highest quality of life as possible? The bulk of hospice care is provided in the um, individual's own home. And um, it's important in this benefit that trained volunteers must provide up to 5% of hospice care. So trained volunteers are a unique component of the hospice benefit. The primary care physician or your specialist remains the, um, involved in your care and still supervises the care in collaboration with the hospice. Unless there's for some reason you don't have primary care, the hospice medical director can become a primary care provider in those situations. Hospice teams are available 24 seven. So uh, there's a nurse on call, usually have access to a doctor or a nurse practitioner as part of the team. Often you have access to a social worker as part of the team 24 hours a day, seven days a week but it is an intermittent service in the home. So typically they're coming in to visit at set amounts of time and frequencies per week and different members of the team might meet on different days. That is based on what your needs are, your care needs are. Uh, there's personal care through hospice aids provided as well as part of that benefit. There are two 90-day benefit periods and then unlimited 60-day benefit periods. And this is just to make sure someone's still appropriate and eligible for hospice services. There are a small percentage of individuals who actually improve while they're in hospice care. And if we can no longer say you have less than six months to live if the disease runs its natural course, then there are occasions where people are discharged from hospice and transition to other services um, because they no longer meet that eligibility criteria. Um, there are four levels of hospice care as well. That care in the home is called routine level of care, but there's also a continuous home care option. If you need intensive care in the home for brief periods of time, it might be 24 to 48 hours in, in, in duration and the bulk of that care must be provided by an RN. And then there's also general inpatient. So if you have a, a symptom that can't be managed in the home, we can uh, move the patient to either a hospital where the hospice has a contract, or it might be a skilled nursing facility where the hospice has a contract and provide more aggressive treatment there for brief periods of time. And then there's also a wonderful benefit for the caregiver, which is called inpatient respite that can be used for five consecutive days. And that is usually um, not in the home. It's usually moving the individual into uh, a place where the hospice has a contract for respite services to give the caregiver a break. So wonderful comprehensive benefit. Um, the other thing important for you to know is the payment and what hospice covers. So any care that's related to your um, primary diagnosis for hospice, um, it might be P PSP in this case, um, that is everything related to that disease is covered by the hospice. Medications, the, the care team, uh, any med medical equipment you might need in the home, a hospital bed, oxygen, um, any um, medications related to that condition that are for symptom management um, and any related conditions to that. Um, and then any other medical supplies, that's all covered by this benefit. So it's a great benefit to access. You're entitled to it when you have Medicare A and it really covers a lot of things. I think a lot of people get concerned about the terminal diagnosis piece of this but, and they access the benefit way too late um, and then wish later that they would have um, started using hospice much sooner than they did. We hear that a lot. Um, what hospice doesn't cover is really anything that's not related to that terminal um, illness or conditions, uh, related conditions. So any um, prescription medications that it might be something that's totally unrelated that is, a, is another condition 
that doesn't contribute to the terminal condition. Um, so that's one example. Um, care that's not arranged by the team. So if you go to the emergency room um, and you haven't notified the team, um, that may cause a problem for your hospice care. They really ask that you always call them first. There's a lot of things that can be done in the home um, to avoid the emergency room and, uh, and not having to go there. It's also, if you need that higher level of care for symptom management, you can actually, with your hospice team, avoid the emergency room altogether and go directly into the hospital and they can help with a direct admission. So um, that's a very helpful thing. Um, and then room and board in a nursing home is not covered by Medicare ever. So that includes the hospice benefit doesn't cover that room and board. You can have hospice services and the hospice benefit while you're in a nursing home, but it does not cover the room and board. Hospice also provides bereavement services. So for up to 13 months after uh, a loved one's death, hospice is available to provide grief support services to um, the loved ones of that individual. Many programs also provide those services to their entire community. And they also will provide those services if there's a disaster in a community. Um, this is done through multiple ways. Sometimes it's letters. Um, it, it, it really determines on the individual's preference for how they want that. There can be individual counseling, group counseling. Um, NHBCO, where I work, offers a bereavement survey that um, hospices can use to determine the evaluation, to, to have people that use their bereavement services evaluate the effectiveness of that. So that's one way we ensure the quality of those services. Hospice um, has to report some public reported measures and they also have to do an experience of care survey for the people that they provide services to. This is typically done by the family at the end of care services. And you can go on this, um, I provided a link in here in your slides that you can go on Hospice Compare and you can actually put in um, for your zip code up to three hospice programs within your area and compare their uh, scores on quality. Um, some of the information down below here is some of the things that are included in that quality. I wanted to talk a little bit, and I have a lot of slides in here, we're not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to give you a sense of some of the um, things that a hospice needs to look at to say if someone is eligible for hospice services. And so um, there's some general guidelines and there's some disease specific guidelines. And you can see that there's things like re recurrent and uncontrollable infections, progressive debility, um, and that's documented by weight loss that's um, not due to reversible causes, um, decreases in measurement of say your arm circumference and your ab ab abdominal girth, um, reduced uh, serum albumin or cholesterol. Um, again, typically if they're available, you don't typically have to have those laboratory tests if they're not available. Um, difficulty swallowing, um, difficulty breathing, uh, and an uncontrollable cough, nausea and vomiting with poor response to treatment, uncontrollable diarrhea, pain that requires increasing doses of medication. Um, so those are some examples, uh, a decline in your blood pressure and um, it, fluid on your abdomen, uh, swelling in your feet, uh, uh, fluid around your, in your lungs or around your heart, increased weakness, changes in your level of con consciousness. These are all general indicators. Um, here's some more specific diagnostic indicators. And then um, they also use these uh, scales like the Karnofsky performance status or the palliative performance scale to kind of indicate where are you at in disease progression. Uh, they do look at the utilization of the patterns of the emergency room hospitalizations to help understand you know, where is someone at with this? They look at functional assessment staging. Uh, so, um, and that's one, uh, just one scale in, in that area. 
um, progression in dependence um, on uh, assistance for the general activities of daily living, bathing, eating, um, ambulation, transferring, um, progressive wound, uh, wounds that are caused by pressure. So um, these are some of the examples. Um, and uh, I think we've gone through some of these already, so I'm skipping through pretty quickly. There's um, some other diseases that also contribute. We talked about the uh, additional conditions that might contribute to a terminal illness. And so some of having some of these illnesses on top of a, another serious illness um, uh, uh, contribute to that. And I know I'm getting close on my time. So I'm gonna just go through these really quickly. Like I say, that you have these available to you. Um, there's some in here that I included that are for um, ALS, uh, that disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, and uh, there's some disease specific there that might uh, be uh, similar to what you'd have in PSP. Um, and they're gonna be similar to what we're in the general. And I also included some of the criteria that they look at in dementia. Um, I, I just wanna leave you with a couple of things here before we go to the Q and A. Um, there is a lack of understanding by hospice providers about your specific disease groups. And really there's an opportunity for you to help educate. And I would really encourage you to reach out to local hospices in your geography and ask to educate their staff and start a relationship with them about that. And they may also be able to put you in contact with other physicians in the area and it might be helpful to educate healthcare teams about this too. Um, we are very happy to work with um, you to help develop tools and resources. So please think about that too. I also um, added a slide here, so I'll make sure that we get this added slide to you. It's a lot of resources we have um, on our website for consumers that is um, related to hospice care, choosing a hospice. There's even a worksheet that you can download. There's a frequently asked questions about hospice. There's also one at the bottom here about palliative care, a comparison of palliative care and hospice. And there's also a great find a provider map that you can use anytime you need to try and find both a palliative care provider, a hospice provider in your geography. Um, I think we're ready. Uh, I believe we're ready for Q&A. Yes, so um, we're open to taking questions in the chat, um, but right now I'm going to ask some pre-submitted questions, um, one of which is um, how to create a generalized protocol for medical staff to recognize PSP patients when they need support that does not fit into the previously standardized set of symptoms for other patients with different levels of required care. You know, that is an excellent question. And it's part of the reason that I gave you the level of detail that I did on the local coverage determinations. Those are a set of resources that are what a fiscal intermediary uses to determine if the hospice um, utilize the benefit appropriately. So the hospice providers use those local coverage determinations to determine eligibility. And then the people that reimburse the hospice on behalf of Medicare also use those local coverage determinations to say whether the hospice was appropriately used or not. And there are occasions when they say hospice wasn't appropriately used. That's why sometimes people are actually even discharged alive from hospice because when they improve, the, the, the fiscal intermediary may determine that hospice should no longer have been um, provided. Um, a beneficiary can um, uh, um, challenge that and that has to be done in writing and a hospice can help with that. But I would say look at those local coverage determinations and go off of what for PSP and like diseases is similar patterns that are in those local coverage determinations to help understand 
the criteria they are looking at to make you eligible for hospice. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Another question that came in, is it correct that tube feeding and hospice care are mutually exclusive? You know, I, I would say uh, it really depends on the hospice. I think there are some hospices that I have found to be very black and white. And um, most hospices would say it, it really depends on the situation. Um, I would like to say, choose a hospice that is more um, focused on individualizing the care based on your situation, rather than a hospice that's very black and white. And I will say I've been on the provider side and provided hospice care. There are times when we did provide hospice care for someone who was getting tube feedings, when we still felt that the tube feedings were a comfort measure for that individual and we're not gonna change the outcome, the eligibility for hospice of less than six months to live if the disease ran its natural course. So I, I think it should depend and should not be that they are mutually exclusive. I will say that a hospice may at some point challenge whether a tube feeding is comfort if we're starting to see signs of constant aspiration of the tube feedings in from the stomach into the lungs, because then it's really contributing honestly to your decline and a more rapid decline, and it's causing more burden than benefit at that point. Thank you. Um, this is a question that came in earlier today, but I thought it might be applicable to this session as well. Critical to support is a professional who has cultural knowledge. The U.S. is a multicultural place, as are these diseases. Where can patients find help that aligns as closely as possible with their cultural background? That's an excellent question. I think that healthcare is recognizing that we need to do better with um, being more um, Culture, culturally um, understanding. And I, there is training that everyone goes through in healthcare on cultural, um, different cultures, understanding different cultures, um, getting more um, uh, um, well-versed in, in providing care that is culturally appropriate. But it, we have more work to do in that area. One of the ways hospices can do that and do do that is using um, volunteers uh, that, especially depending on your geography, um, what is your community makeup and, and do you have volunteers of different cultures to help with the patients of different cultures. But you also should have access always to translators for your patients. Um, and there are some uh, some places where you can find um, services that are more tailored to one culture than another. Um, I know that there are some hospice programs that, that are led by Jewish, the Jewish faith, for example, and there are some other services that are more um, culturally uh, um, appropriate for some folks than others. So you can look for those, but I always say that's a good question to ask when you're looking at services like palliative care and hospice, and you want to make sure it's culturally correct, um, how, do they, how do they account for that? It's a good question to ask. And I encourage people to honestly shop before you need these services, to have an understanding of who provides what out there. And I would use a, a worksheet to kind of help you vet through some of the questions you might have. And cultural competence is one of the things you should ask about. Terrific, thank you so much. And, you know, we have time for one last piece of advice. And so Lori, what do you think is probably the most frequently asked question to you in your profession? Well, I think the question I get a lot now is there's a lot of um, interest with palliative care and a lot of people are looking for palliative care services and having a hard time finding them. Um, I've had people call me, consumers call the office and say, where is it? I can't find it. And again, one of the links I provided for you in that added slide that I'll make sure we get out uh, to you, Jacqueline, and to your team 
um, is a find a provider map. And you can scroll that map to look at palliative care services. But just remember that we don't yet have the full reimbursement for those services that we do for hospice. And so um, sometimes people really are looking for hospice services further upstream. If you need services that are the full comprehensive amount of services that hospice provides, don't let your fear of death and dying stop you from asking a hospice if you meet the criteria. Because people wait too long to get to hospice services. They try to use palliative care services in replacement of hospice, but you're never gonna get the amount of service upstream in palliative care that you can get in hospice. You need to use them both appropriately and let's hope that you have access to palliative care services. They are growing. They're more prevalent in hospitals than they are in the home, but we are growing out those services. We are working very hard at NHPCO to push the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation to create a um, community-based palliative care model. But in the meantime, don't let your needs, um, don't let your fear of hospice keep you from that benefit if it is what you need. You wanna to get to the right service at the right time. You can use that benefit for a long time. If it's at six months you've been in hospice, you're not gonna automatically lose it. It's an unlimited benefit. So don't let your fear of death and dying stop you from using that benefit. You're entitled to it. Wonderful, thank you so, so much. This is so important and for everybody to know and we really really appreciate you being here today and I want everybody to stick around just for a couple more minutes we have two small pieces coming up and the big reveal of the social listening mural so thank you everybody and thank you Lori thank you so much Jacqueline and, and thank you all for all the good work that you do take care <laughs>